Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. So uh, this talk, I wanted to look at the um, epidemiology and the impact of bladder cancer, and then um, go right into neoadjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, talk a little bit about some bladder preservation protocol results, and then uh, sum it all up at the end. Uh, looking at the epidemiology, there's about 6,600 cases um, of bladder cancer in Canada. Three quarters of them are male. Uh, 1,700 deaths related to bladder cancer in uh, year 2000. In Canada, your aggregate chance of developing bladder cancer is about 3.5% and your chance of dying from bladder cancer is about 1%. Looking at the percentage of new cancer cases by type for males, so of course the big three uh, predominate, prostate, lung, and colorectal. However, coming in fourth there at 6% for new cancer diagnosis is uh, bladder cancer. So unfortunately, it's hard to judge the, uh, the trends in Canada due to differences in reporting of uh, different types of bladder cancer. However, looking at the SEER database in the U.S., which is a bit more consistent, the um, incidence of bladder cancer has been rising over the past 40 years. However, bladder cancer mortality has been decreasing, and there are a couple of different reasons why this might be. It might be due to us, improved treatment. It might be due to earlier diagnosis, and it might be due to a change in the actual tumor biology itself. So looking at the impact of bladder cancer, um, we know that bladder cancer almost always presents during a person's lifetime. Um, autopsy studies from back in the day rarely demonstrated incidental bladder cancers, and this implies that all bladder cancers are of clinical significance and likely require treatment. So looking at the impact of bladder cancers, we know that about 70% of bladder tumors are non-muscle invasive at presentation. So of these, about 20% are CIS, 70% are TA, and 10% are T1. Now, of those, the probability of progression for CIS is probably greater than 50%. For TA low grade, or the old G2, it's 5 to 10%. And TA high grade, it's uh, 15 to 40%. T1 high grade, about 30 to 50%. Uh, one of the bigger series looking at progression uh, was published looking at 2,500 patients from the EORTC uh, trials. Um, they found some significant variables in their multivariate analysis. Uh, looking at progression, namely stage, the presence of CIS and grade all influence uh, progression, and recurrence, which is influenced by whether the tumor is already recurred, the number of tumors, and the tumor size. So just to uh, summarize that, about a third of bladder tumors are muscle invasive at presentation. Risk factors will influence the progression of lower stage lesions, and a significant number of bladder cancers will require radical treatment. So moving on to talk about the radical cystectomy a little bit. It's the standard of care for localized muscle invasive bladder cancer. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is this is the standard of care, how well does our gold standard perform? So this is a contemporary series out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, looking at uh, 300 patients operated on in the early 90s. Um, looking at the demographics of this group, uh, just over half were T2 or T3. 22% uh, uh, received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and 6% received neoadjuvant radiation therapy. So first interesting thing to look at here is the staging, and you can compare clinical and pathological staging. Um, the important thing to note is there's a significant uh, discordance between pathological and clinical staging. Um, classically in the literature, it's been quoted as between 30 and 50% uh, variety. Second thing to note is that um, in pathological staging, there is a proportion of patients who are PT0. And in other words, there's no tumor found within the bladder, um, likely due to the uh, TUR or the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And finally, you can note that there's a proportion of patients who are going to be nodal positive, and this proportion is about 15%. Looking at overall survival, so this is all comers treated with a radical cystectomy during these years. Uh, Five-year uh, survival is about 45%. When you break it down by stage, stage obviously influences survival with T2 lesions having about a 65% five-year survival and T3 lesions having about a 35% five-year survival. Disease-specific survival is slightly better, however, still, uh, still not great for a uh, five-year outlook. So what can we learn from this study? That there are worse outcomes for patients with non-organ-confined tumors, so T3 or T4 lesions versus organ-confined tumors. Um, nodal positive disease occurs in about 15% of patients and has a higher disease-specific and overall mortality, which is second only to stage and impact on survival. And about 10% of patients have PT0 uh, disease at time of cystectomy. So this raises uh, a few questions. First one, can chemotherapy improve the survival of all comers? Obviously, all comers' survival is still not great, and this uh, leads us to neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. 
Second question, can further therapy uh, specifically targeted at the high uh, risk groups, in other words, non-organ confined bladder cancer or nodal positive disease, uh, improve their survival? Asking about adjuvant chemotherapy. And then finally, is there a subset of patients uh, with muscle invasive tumors that can be treated with bladder preservation protocols? And in other words, there's a group of patients who are PT0. Is there a way to identify these patients and possibly uh, target them for bladder preservation? So we'll start with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Some of the advantages of neoadjuvant chemotherapy are hypothetical advantages, I guess, of this model. It'll treat micrometastatic disease. We know this is the predominant mechanism of distant uh, recurrence of bladder cancer. It may reduce the size of the primary tumor, making local control easier. We know that tolerance to chemotherapy is generally better preoperatively. Um, patients at that point generally have a good performance status. They have a good compliance with protocols. And postoperatively, you usually have to wait at least six to eight weeks uh, before um, administering chemotherapy. Fourth possible advantage is going to treat uh, disease burden while it's still small versus waiting for, uh, I guess, a salvage chemotherapy type protocol when actual nodal or metastatic disease uh, develops. And finally, another important advantage is that you can actually monitor the tumor to see if it is chemoresponsive or not. You can base this on cystoscopy, CT scan, physical exam. Now, some of the disadvantages of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy model. Uh, the first one, obviously, you're basing this on clinical staging. And we know the correlation between clinical and pathological staging is poor. Most of the reports in the literature have reported a discordance of 30 to 40 percent uh, between clinical and pathological stage. Second potential disadvantage is there's a delay to definitive treatment. So this is a classic study published out of Philadelphia looking at uh, radical cystectomies and dividing them into two groups. One group that was treated within 12 weeks of the TURBT and one group treated uh, greater than 12 weeks from the TURBT. These were all muscle invasive tumors. They found 19 patients who had a delay greater than 12 weeks. Interestingly, most of this was from patients seeking uh, multiple medical opinions. Looking at the overall survival of these two groups, you can see a significant difference uh, both statistically and obviously between the two uh, survival curves. Um, also, there is a significantly increased proportion of patients in those who delayed, uh, delayed uh, time to definitive therapy in terms of T3 disease and in terms of nodal positive disease. So really, that study probably doesn't set a, uh, an absolute line at 12 weeks. It simply shows us that you know, faster is better when it comes to uh, treating uh, bladder cancer. Third potential disadvantage is systemic toxicity of chemotherapy. So giving these patients, uh, giving all comers uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy obviously is not a benign thing to recommend. Um, looking at some of the results and toxicity from some of the trials, the EORTC trial, 491 patients received new adjuvant chemotherapy um, in the form of CMV. About 80% of them were able to tolerate their full three cycles. Um, there was about a 5% nephrotoxicity rate and a 1% mortality rate in this trial. And we'll look at the trial a little, in a little bit here. Um, looking at the SWOG trial of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, this was with MVAC in this case. 87% uh, of patients were able to tolerate at least one cycle of MVAC, and there were no deaths related to chemotherapy in this uh, study. And importantly, no differences in post-stop complications either. However, when you look at the grade 3 and grade 4 toxicity, you can see almost a third of patients experience at least one grade 3 or grade 4 toxicity, mostly in the form of granulocytopenia, which likely resolved. Um, however, that does, of course, put them at risk for other uh, complications. And finally, the uh, last potential disadvantage of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a perception that it will increase perioperative mortality. Um, this has largely been disproven in the studies we're going to go over and in actually a nice RCT out of MD Anderson. They took 140 patients and randomized them to either adjuvant therapy or neoadjuvant therapy with MVAC. Um, looking at the mortality rates in the two different groups, so the patients who had immediate surgery, six patients died from postoperative complications versus the immediate chemotherapy group had uh, four patients altogether who died, three from fatal uh, MVAC toxicity and one from rapid disease progression. So there was no statistical difference in uh, mortality between these two groups. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we've discussed the advantages, the potential disadvantages. You're dealing with clinical stage only, you're delaying time to definitive therapy, and you're dealing with systemic toxicity. Um, if you consider these disadvantages um, and you still think it's reasonable to proceed, the next question, of course, is are you going to be offering your patient an increased survival? And there have been uh, several randomized trials that have looked at this. Um, we'll go over some of the bigger ones here, the EORTC, the SWOG trial, and the combined analysis for the Nordic trial briefly.
So the first one, the EORTC trial, this was a trial carried out in the early 90s, um, looking at the, uh, the role of CMV in a neoadjuvant fashion. Um, they decided to exclude uh, doxorubicin, so in other words, exclude it from the standard MVAC protocol um, due to interactions with radiation therapy for which a lot of these patients received and concerns about the increased toxicity of it. Inclusion criteria for this study, basically any uh, muscle invasive tumor, um, it had to be TCC or a mixed TCC tumor, had to be less than 7 centimeters. Uh, there was no obvious nodal mets in these patients and they had to have a minimum GFR of 50. They were randomized to receive three cycles of CMV over nine weeks and cystectomy versus cystectomy alone. And the trial was uh, very nicely worked out in terms of powering. Um, it was powered to detect a 10% survival difference in three years. This 10% was actually based on a survey of um, oncologists. 75% uh, of them felt that 10% survival benefit would be uh, reasonable to actually recommend uh, neoadjuvant therapy to their patients. 15% um, thought you'd have to have at least 15% uh, survival benefit. So, you know, it's not a number just drawn out of thin air, which is uh, nice. Looking at the results, 976 patients were uh, randomized to the study. 491 received chemo. Um, the majority of them received the full course of chemo, uh, remembering it's only uh, CMV in this case. Mortality, about 1%. Uh, 465 patients received no chemotherapy. Uh, now, interestingly, a good number of patients in uh, this cohort actually had uh, radiation as their primary therapy for uh, bladder cancer. 60 patients, 66 patients had both radiation and cystectomy, and in the study itself, over 80% uh, of patients' uh, deaths were related to TCC. So looking at the survival of these two groups out to five years, um, there was no significant difference in uh, overall survival. Um, it was close to significance and definitely shows a trend. Um, interesting, the second point is about 32% of patients had a complete response from the neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, or the TUR, um, and were PT0. Uh, however, in this study, they didn't actually show an increased uh, survival. And these results have been updated at uh, ASCO, and they did uh, reach clinical significance at that point with a uh, five-year survival difference of 5.5%. So what can we conclude from this study? Um, I think the most uh, conservative conclusions that can be taken are that there's a trend towards increased, increased survival on the magnitude of about 5%. However, to actually detect this 5% difference, the trial would have to be powered with 3,000 patients, which it obviously wasn't. Uh, neoadjuvant CMV appears to be a safe uh, protocol. Mortality was 1%, which they defined as acceptable. It was well tolerated in that the majority of patients were actually able to complete the regime, the full three cycles, and there was no evidence of increased progression due to delay in cystectomy. So the second trial going on uh, simultaneously with the uh, uh, EORTC trial was the SWOG trial. Um, done in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. 317 patients were randomized to MVAC neo neoadjuvant chemotherapy or not, uh, three cycles, and then treated with uh, radical cystectomy. Inclusion criteria, again, fairly similar, except this study actually excluded patients who were treated with uh, radiation. They were all muscle invasive tumors, and they all had a good performance status. They also stratified it by stage and by age. They were uh, fairly optimistic in their powering calculations and powered the study to detect a 50% improvement in uh, median survival. Looking at the results, um, so time to surgery obviously significantly longer with the chemotherapy group. Um, we went over the uh, toxicity of this trial already, so about a third of patients had a grade 4 granulocytopenia, a third of patients had grade 3 toxicity of some form. In terms of post-operative complications, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Looking at overall survival, again, median survival was uh, not significantly different, although there's definitely a trend towards impre sorry, improved survival with uh, um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Median survival in that group was 77 months versus 46 months in uh, cystectomy alone. The survival advantage, uh, importantly, was maintained across both stage and age groups. Secondly, looking at the PT0 effect, so about 38% uh, of patients treated with the neoadjuvant uh, MVAC had PT0 versus 15% in the cystectomy-only group. Um, this trial did indeed uh, demonstrate an increased survival um, in patients treated with, uh, with, or in patients who developed a PT0 tumor in terms of uh, five-year survival. Um, it was significantly better at uh, 85%. So conclusions again from this trial, um, there's a reduced risk of death of 
um, and neoadjuvant MVAC is uh, safe. There's no treatment mortality in this trial. There was a significant amount of toxicity, um, and there was no evidence of um, perioperative complications or inability to perform the radical cystectomy due to uh, the chemotherapy. And finally, I just want to touch on these two briefly. I won't go into too much detail. Um, there's a combined analysis published of the Nordic trials, Nordic 1 and Nordic 2, carried out in Finland. The first trial uh, randomized 320 patients um, with uh, invasive or high-risk tumors um, to uh, cisplatinum and doxorubicin preoperatively, along with preop uh, radiation. So this was a chemo radiation, uh, uh, a neoadjuvant chemo radiation protocol, basically. And, um, and then treated them with radical cystectomy. And they did not show a significant difference in uh, survival between the two groups. There was a, uh, in subgroup analysis, there was a trend towards uh, better results um, in the uh, PT3 and normal positive groups. The Nordic 2 trial, um, they took out the radiation in this follow-up trial. They put 317 patients through cisplatinum and methotrexate. And again, this trial uh, did not demonstrate any significant uh, difference between overall survival. So, like uh, any good uh, scientist, I guess, they looked for a way to make it significant, and um, they combined the two trial groups. Obviously, it's a bit of a different, uh, different population in that one population was treated with radiation. Um, however, they justified it by saying that their um, two centers, it was done in the same centers with the same surgeons, same doctors, same follow-up protocols, um, even though the chemotherapy was different. Anyway, short, long story short, they did demonstrate uh, significant, uh, significantly improved survival with their uh, chemotherapeutic uh, regime um, in combined analysis with about an 8% uh, survival advantage in those um, who were treated with uh, new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy of some sort. So conclusions again, the trials were similar in design, so they decided to uh, combine them uh, to show uh, statistical significance. Uh, there's a small survival benefit in both trials, um, which is a trend when put together is statistically significant. Um, and again, the other, the most important thing probably these trials show us is again, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a safe uh, regime to undertake. Post-op morbidity and mortality was uh, similar between the two groups. So looking at the summary of all these trials, we've talked about a few of them. Um, a few of them we haven't. Uh, there's a smattering of trials that show no significant difference between, uh, in survival between neoadjuvant and radical cystectomy, and there's a smattering of trials who do show a trend, um, but again, very few that have actually showed uh, statistical significance. So what to do? Uh, Meta-analysis, of course. Um, so the bladder uh, cancer um, uh, collaboration uh, got together and found uh, 11 RCTs that have been published in the literature representing about 3,000 patients. They uh, included uh, randomized trials basically that used a cisplatinum uh, or platinum containing uh, agent for chemotherapy. That's the uh, most effective, of course. Those are the trials they included there. And when they look at their overall survival curves, um, five year survival was about 55% uh, for those treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus 50% for those uh, treated without neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So, conclusions from this uh, meta analysis again, being fairly conservative with them, best results are from platinum based combination therapies. They were able to show that in their preliminary uh, data and there's an absolute survival benefit of about 5% in five years. Still obviously not uh, all that close to the 10% that most uh, oncologists decided would be significant enough to justify treatment. So the big but with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So we haven't reached that survival threshold of 10% that most clinicians felt would be significant. There's no good quality of life data to support neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, subgroup analysis, most subgroup analysis show a much reduced benefit to the average risk T2 patient. And of course, it's hard, we know, from clinical and pathological staging to actually preoperatively uh, select those patients who might be, uh, might be at uh, higher risk. There's likely a greater benefit in higher risk patients, the PT3 or the nodal positive patients, but it's hard to do an RTC with these patients uh, pre-selected. The quality of surgery in all these studies is going to be a confounding factor. Um, on analysis of the SWOG data, they demonstrated that margin status and the number of nodes resected were both uh, independent uh, prognosticators of uh, survival. And finally, these RCTs, of course, is important to keep in mind, focus on the best subgroup of uh, bladder cancer patients. Most of them have a primary age range of 60 to 75 years old, whereas 40% of bladder cancer in the SEER database is over 70 years old. They're all ECOG 0 or 1 for the most part. 
and their creatinine clearance is generally pretty good, which in those over 70, only 50% have a GFR of 50 or greater. So, yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, it was eight or nine, I think. I mean, that had the biggest influence, obviously, because that was 1,200 patients of the 3,000, so... Very good. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. I never see the patients. I only see them if they're P4 or N2 or N positive or something. So does, does anybody here think it's worth it? Very good. So we'll talk at least sort of into adjuvant chemotherapy. So when you actually know you've got the high-risk patient, uh, can you help them with chemotherapy? Um, so we know that about 50% of patients with high-grade high grade bladder cancer and T2B or greater will die within two years of presentation. Um, adjuvant chemotherapy has been widely used for T2, T3 and T4 disease or nonopositive disease, and this is based mostly on its success in other solid organ tumors. Um, when used as a primary therapy for nodal positive disease or metastatic disease, MVAC uh, does provide uh, for some improved survival. Um, one study looked at uh, some risk factors, so functional status and visceral METs were the two risk factors they identified that were significant in multivariate analysis. Um, survival, whether you had none, one, or both of these risk factors, was 33, 13, or 9 months. Um, survival in patients who were able to attain a or uh, sorry, 25 to 35% of patients with metastatic or nodal positive disease attain a complete response. 
and we know the five-year um, survival is significantly better with uh, MVAC chemotherapy in the terms of uh, 30 to 40 percent for those treated with chemotherapy versus 17 percent for uh, all comers. So the theoretical advantages of adjuvant chemotherapy, it allows for local control to be established first with radical cystectomy. Perhaps most importantly, your treatment is going to be based on pathological stage, so you're going to be able to select out patients who are most likely to, uh, to benefit um, theoretically from the chemotherapy. There's no delay in time to surgery. And finally, you're going to be treating micro metastases while their volume is still micro. And in other words, not waiting for salvage chemotherapy when they actually develop METs or nodal positive disease. Um, we know that 10 to 15 percent of locally treated bladder cancer tends to recur within 6 to 12 months. So the theory behind that would be that would be the micrometastatic disease showing itself. And if we could treat that in the high risk patients, uh, that may um, improve uh, survival significantly. So disadvantage of adjuvant chemotherapy, electrolyte and renal function may be worsened with the ileal loop or neobladder. Um, there may be a delay in therapy um, for occult metastases as opposed to doing neoadjuvant therapy, basically. Um, there's no way to monitor tumor response to see if further cycles are worthwhile. So we know that a portion of tumors do respond and a portion of tumors do not respond to uh, MVAC chemotherapy. And when you've removed the bladder, generally you've removed your, uh, your primary sort of... Uh, uh, dipstick to test uh, how well uh, chemotherapy is working. And finally, the last disadvantage, MVAC, is, uh, does have some uh, significant toxicities. Um, it's associated with severe neutropenia, mucocytosis, nausea, vomiting. It has uh, several end organ toxicities and has a toxic death rate of about 1 to 3 percent, as classically been, classically been reported in the literature. So looking at the randomized trials, looking at uh, adjuvant therapy, um, if you thought the neoadjuvant therapy data was a little bit thin, the adjuvant chemotherapy data is really thin. Um, there's a few trials, most with uh, about 100 to 150 patients at most. And this obviously represents uh, difficult uh, to accrue patients for clinical trials. So the first trial we'll just go through is the uh, classic one that uh, Skinner published and it sort of uh, provided the impetus for a lot of adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, Skinner from University of Southern uh, California in the 80s randomized 91 patients. They had to have had an invasive bladder cancer and T3, T4, nodal positive disease without evidence of metastatic disease. He excluded patients with previous chemotherapy radiation with poor end organ function or with a very poor functional status. And they were randomized either chemotherapy or no chemotherapy six weeks after radical cystectomy. The chemotherapy consisted of uh, four courses of cisplatinum, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide. Uh, unfortunately, the 17 initial patients uh, were treated with a variety of cisplatinum-based uh, regimes, which sort of clouds the issue a little bit. Looking at the results, the median age of his patients was 62. About a third of them had nodal positive disease, and two-thirds of them were T3 and a quarter T4. So it's a very high-risk population. Um, in the chemotherapy group here, you can sort of see the added toxicity of uh, MVAC. Only 50% of patients were actually able to complete three or four cycles of uh, chemotherapy. 34% completed zero or one cycle. Uh, most of them stopped due to the toxicity or due to the uncertain benefit. And he didn't report any deaths uh, from the chemotherapy. So looking at his survival, um, overall survival for the cystectomy group, 2.4 years. For the cystectomy and chemotherapy group, 4.25 years. Um, again, it seems like a big difference, but it wasn't statistically significant, um, and the trial was uh, underpowered. Um, in the subgroup of patients with one node positive, there was a significant difference in terms of uh, survival, um, especially in the uh, cystectomy and chemotherapy group. However, as soon as you have two nodes or more positive, this survival advantage disappears, which is uh, not entirely uh, consistent. Um, the updated results uh, show a three-year survival of 68% for cystectomy and chemotherapy, three-year survival of 47% for cystectomy alone. And this was approaching statistical significance but hadn't uh, quite reached it. So before we get too excited, uh, a lot of people have sort of uh, torn apart this study in the literature and it's got some uh, definite flaws in it. Um, only about 62% of eligible patients were entered into the trial, so there may have been a significant uh, selection bias. Um, the trial was significantly underpowered. You need about 400 to 1,000 patients to detect a 10 to 15% survival uh, difference. There was poor compliance with chemotherapy in that uh, only 50% of patients actually received a therapeutic course. Um, a variety of chemotherapeutic uh, protocols were used initially. Um, he was taken to task a little bit on his statistical methods as well and the uh, tests he chose to uh, show his significance. 
And finally, of course, subgroup analysis is always questionable, and basically the conclusions of this trial were mostly based on the statistical significance of the one node positive group, um, not uh, from the overall group. Second trial to talk about uh, briefly is Stockel's trial out of uh, Mainz, Germany, done in the late 80s. Patients were, received to, uh, were randomized to receive three cycles of um, MVAC in an adjuvant fashion. They had a goal of 100 patients. So 49 patients were randomized. 60% had nodal positive disease. Most of them were T4, again, a very high-risk group. Um, about uh, two-thirds of patients received two to three cycles of the chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the trial was stopped at the interim analysis, and this was primarily based on the fact that 12 out of 13 of the nodal positive patients in the control arm had progression versus 3 out of 11 in the, uh, in the, system, in the um, chemotherapy group. So uh, Stockel said that it was hard to ethically and uh, get ethically randomized patients uh, further, and it was hard to get informed consent from patients after this point. That's how he justifies the early stoppage. When you look at the uh, progression-free survival for these patients, the two lines are uh, obviously widely divergent um, and statistically significant. Progression-free survival is 59% uh, at um, three years for the uh, cystectomy and chemotherapy group versus 13% for the cystectomy alone group. Now, of course, this looks, uh, this looks pretty good, but one of the things that probably influences this survival curve is the fact that cystectomy only patients were not offered uh, salvage chemotherapy if they developed metastatic disease. Therefore, the uh, dotted line there is probably a lot lower than it should have been. Of course, this is balanced by the fact that not all patients received their full uh, cycles of chemotherapy, which would, tend to, uh, which would tend to exacerbate the difference if there is indeed one. So looking at the trials for adjuvant chemotherapy, if you look on the uh, left there, um, Again, there's a variety of results. Most of the ones that uh, do say benefit next to them all have a but next to them as well. Um, the trials are generally underpowered. They were stopped early, um, or they showed uh, significance in subgroups only. So the answer, again, of course, is a meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis done by the same group, the Advanced Bladder Cancer Group, um, is a little bit stronger, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, six RCTs were selected with about 500 patients. They all used cystectomy for local control, and they all use some sort of cisplatinum-based uh, chemotherapy, mostly in combination. These are the uh, six studies they selected, so Skinner and Stockel were both in there. Looking at their uh, five-year survival data, five-year survival was about 9% uh, better in the uh, cystectomy and adjuvant chemotherapy group versus the control group. So, conclusion, 9% improved survival at three years with the cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. And the thing that makes this meta-analysis special is that they actually were able to um, obtain individual patient data for those trials for the majority of patients, over 90% of the patients. So they're actually able to analyze um, the patient data themselves as opposed to having to try to interpret it from the written studies. Um, this allowed them to look at overall survival, which was something a lot of trials didn't report, and also to standardize the statistical methods, which was a criticism of a lot of these uh, studies. Again, adjuvant chemotherapy has a but after it. You would need 900 patients to detect a 9% survival benefit. So again, this shows a trend. Most of the trials um, individually have poor statistical design. They all have small sample sizes. Four out of six of the trials were stopped early, which we know in, um, from the statistical literature increases the chance of stopping on a random high. And it uh, provides a uh, modest evidence uh, at best for adjuvant chemotherapy. The meta-analysis actually concluded that there was insufficient evidence from their point of view to uh, recommend uh, adjuvant therapy. I don't know if there are any uh, comments on adjuvant therapy yet at uh, this time. Perfect. So is there hope for better evidence? And the answer is yes. Um, EORTC is doing a very well-designed randomized trial, 30994. They're looking at accruing 660 patients. Um, they started doing this in 2001. Patients are going to be randomized to immediate versus deferred chemotherapy, which is appropriate. The control group is going to be the, uh, the standard of care. They're going to be high-risk patients, so T3, T4, or nodal positive disease patients. They're going to start chemotherapy within 90 days of cystectomy. Within the chemotherapy arm itself, they're going to be randomized to classical MVAC, high-dose MVAC, and um, gemcitabine cisplatinum. That's a look at their proposed protocol, endpoints, overall survival, and progression-free survival. And uh, this study obviously looks pretty good. The problem with it, as with many bladder cancer, um, high-risk bladder cancer studies, is, of course, problems with accrual. 
Um, as of uh, last week, they'd only accrued about 275 patients. So despite being open for seven years, they haven't even reached the uh, halfway point. Um, so there's uh, no point holding your breath for this uh, data, unfortunately. It's going to be a while. So the last topic I want to touch on just briefly uh, to end is multimodal bladder preservation. So if we want to challenge the gold standard, which is radical cystectomy, we need to know what's the survival of the gold standard and what's the quality of life of the gold standard, and then compare it to whatever is new. So what's the mortality associated with cystectomy in the five-year survival? Mortality has decreased significantly over the last uh, 40 years. It's now at around 1% to 3% in terms of operative mortality. However, survival by stage hasn't really changed much since the, uh, since the um, 80s. Uh, it's still about 66% uh, for T2 disease, 35% for P3, and 27% for P4 disease in terms of five-year survival. What's the quality of life after a cystectomy? This one's a little harder to answer. We know that orthotopic bladders generally have a higher quality of life than the ileal conduit. Um, possible theories, the leakage is easier to disguise, better cosmetics, normal type voiding, and uh, the quality of life is pretty close to what they had with an intact bladder. However, quality of life, the biggest impact on this is on uh, preoperative expectations. So the question is, can we match these results and select patients with some sort of bladder preservation approach? We know that 10 to 15 percent of patients are P0 after radical cystectomy. Uh, several studies have shown improved survival in the P0 group. Um, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy results in an increased number of P0 cancers. The SWOG trial was 38 percent. EURTC trial was 33 percent. So this sort of gives us a hint that maybe there's a group of patients out there that we don't need to do a radical cystectomy on. So first question, what happens to patients treated just with a TURBT for T2 disease? Um, these are patients over the last 50 years in various series. You can see T2A survival is reasonable. It comes out at about uh, 60 to 65 percent. As soon as you go up to T2B, however, the TURBT is clearly uh, not sufficient and survival uh, plummets down to the 30 percent range. So the classic uh, paper by Dr. Harry Herr, um, 151 patients treated with cystectomy or TUR alone. Um, his protocol basically was patients underwent an initial TUR by another urologist and then were referred into him. He did a restaging TUR on all of them. His protocol was to resect down to fat and then resect one to two centimeters lateral um, into new, normal uh, bladder tissue. If the repeat TUR had T0 or TIS or T1, they were given a choice, radical cystectomy or bladder preservation. They were recommended to have a salvage cystectomy if they had recurrent disease, um, BCG refractory, CIS, or CT abnormalities. So looking at uh, his patient flow here, basically he had 450 patients he saw over the 80s. Um, 151 of them were T0 or T1 on, an, on a re-resection, despite having an initial um, resection showing muscle invasion. Um, of these patients, 52 opted for immediate cystectomy and 99 opted for uh, conservative therapy. Looking at his 20-year uh, data for survival, um, there was no significant difference uh, in survival um, between the TUR and the cystectomy group. So, of course, it's important to realize this isn't really a randomized trial, and um, it basically gives us a hint of um, the fact that there might be a future for an RCT in this area, but it, it definitely isn't evidence to, uh, to base practice on necessarily. Um, who may be a candidate for this approach? Uh, stage 2 patients, obviously. Tumor less than 3 centimeters, absence of hydro, absence of a mass, and unifocal disease. Um, next question, what can be gained with the addition of chemotherapy? There have been several sort of uh, phase 2 trials looking at uh, uh, conservative therapy in terms of a partial cystectomy or a TURBT and chemotherapy. The most recent one by uh, Sternberg in 2003 looked at 104 patients treated with MVAC and then restaged. Those that responded, um, 52 responded and uh, simply received a repeat TUR. 13% of patients responded to the MVAC and received a partial cystectomy. 39 uh, went on to receive a radical cystectomy for continued invasive disease. So those who underwent the TUR, half of them were PT0, and there was a 60% five-year survival in this group with 45% of them maintaining their bladder out to five years. So about half of them did require a salvage cystectomy eventually. And the main thing that this trial tells us is it's all about how you respond to the chemotherapy. If you do respond to the chemotherapy and a PT0, you had a 69% five-year survival. If you didn't respond um, and you had uh, continued disease, you had a 27% five-year survival. So just a few conclusions to end here. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we know the potential advantages. 
disadvantages. You're dealing with clinical stage only. There's a, defla- a delay to definitive therapy, and there's some systemic toxicity associated with it. Toxicity and mortality in the range of 1% to 3% is acceptable with MVAC, likely better with GC. Um, obviously, most of the studies here have all looked at MVAC. Uh, a lot of, patient, a lot of uh, oncologists, I think, have switched to using GC more as a standard of care now based on data in metastatic patients. Um, the best available data suggests a modest increase of survival, probably if we go by 5% or at least 5% at five years. Um, the benefits likely minimal for T2 patients, likely increased for the higher risk patients. Adjuvant therapy advantages, good local control, treatments based on pathological stage, and you're treating micrometastases. Disadvantages, as you see there, the ones we've discussed about. Uh, in terms of adjuvant therapy, quality evidence is obviously uh, lacking. Upcoming well, well-powered uh, randomized controlled trial from EORTC uh, around maybe 2015 should uh, answer this question for us. And finally, bladder preservation should be approached cautiously. Obviously, there's been no RCTs comparing uh, TUR, chemotherapy, plus minus radiation to a cystectomy alone, and that's really the next step if, uh, if we're going to pursue this avenue. Um, if you are going to do this in select patients, they've got to understand the, uh, um, the risks of delayed cystectomy and the risk of disease progression. The patient must be motivated, and they must be willing to accept the uh, intensive follow-up that's uh, necessary. Patients that may be candidates, again, localized disease, basically. After the first TUR, um, if you're going to do the bladder preservation protocol, you should definitely re-resect at three months. That's what most of the uh, larger series have done. And if there is any residual disease, basically the second staging um, is a big uh, influence in terms of survival. Um, PT0 survival is much better than PT1 uh, survival at this point. And finally, the addition of chemotherapy has produced uh, survival um, similar to radical cystectomy in some small series. Um, failure to respond to chemotherapy is a big warning flag if someone's going to undertake this, um, this protocol and should prompt an urgent, urgent cystectomy. And the morbidity of chemotherapy plus minus radiation obviously is, uh, is significant. Um, and we don't know if that's going to be better than undergoing a radical cystectomy. That's it. Thank you.